This is CBC Here and Now. Our goal is to ensure that all Newfoundlanders and every Newfoundlander and Labradorian has access to primary care. Another health care pre-budget announcement, 10 new family care teams for the province. As of right now, no, we have no options at all. Um, it's super stressful. Some parents in this province are being put in an impossible situation. They have to choose between their career or childcare. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now, I'm Peter Cowan. There's breaking news tonight related to a CBC News story that we first brought you this morning. We told you that the province is going to court to try and stop an investigation into the health care cyber attack. That investigation is being done by the Privacy Commissioner, Michael Harvey. The province filed documents accusing Harvey of bias because he was an assistant deputy minister in the health department until 2019, saying his current investigation deals with issues that arose when he held that position and asking a judge to stop him from proceeding. Now Harvey is stepping back from the ongoing cyber attack investigation. In a statement issued late this afternoon, he rejected those claims of bias and says he's done nothing wrong. The commissioner believes that it is in the public interest and in accordance with his statutory mandate to have the investigation completed in a timely manner and the report released to the public. For this reason, Commissioner Harvey has decided to recuse himself from further involvement in the investigation to avoid a lengthy and expensive court proceeding. That statement was issued just hours after the government's court action came up in the House of Assembly. Yeah, Can the please. Premier tell the people of this province why his government is suing the Privacy Commissioner in order to stop him from investigating a cyber attack? The Honourable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as the member opposite knows, this is a, the cyber attack was incredibly stressful to the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. It's important that a robust, fair review be undertaken, Mr. Speaker. We just want to ensure that there is such a process in place, a robust process in place. If the member stops chirping, I'm, I'm happy to answer, Mr. Speaker. But Order, we, want, we want to ensure that there's a fair process in place, one that does not have an apprehension bias, Mr. Order, please. The Honourable the Premier. One that does not have an apprehension bias, so the people of Newfoundland and Labrador can have a full and fulsome review of what happened, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Well, still with politics, we're getting another peek at what will be announced in the provincial budget later this week. Today, politicians announced $21 million is coming for new teen clinics that will provide primary care. Here now's Mark Quinn has that story. More than 136,000 people in this province don't have a family doctor, according to the Newfoundland and Labrador Medical Association. The provincial government says that number is much lower, fewer than 50,000. Whatever the true number is, the province says today's announcement of 10 new clinics will increase access to care. Look, I'm not going to debate the validity of the variance within the numbers. Our goal is to ensure that all Newfoundlanders and every Newfoundlander and Labradorian has access to primary care. This is a model that will help address uh, the disconnect between patient and primary care. What used to be called collaborative teen clinics, a mouthful, are now being called three, two, one. family care teams. There are now eight of them in the province, and today the government announced they'll start building the next 10 teams in 2023. It's estimated that 120 people will be needed, including administration and health care providers, to staff these new facilities. We've implemented and continue to implement a number of measures to attract and retain healthcare professionals to work in our province, including those who will staff family care teams. Like the numerous healthcare announcements in the past few months, today's was short on details. We don't know the exact locations of the clinics that are promised, and we don't know when they'll be open. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And another pre-budget health care announcement. Government announced that the following blood thinners are now going to be covered under the prescription drug program. You see the names on your screen there. I'm not going to try and pronounce them. The drugs are used to help treat and prevent strokes and blood clots. It's estimated that about 3,500 people in Newfoundland and Labrador take them.
Good evening, everyone. Heather Gillis filling in for Ashley Brawler again tonight. Let's take a look at your weather that is on the way. It looks like it's going to be a cloudy evening for much of the island portion of the province with a chance of flurries. Pretty well island wide kind of thing. And then when we get into Labrador, we should pick up a few centimeters of snow up to five. So not a whole lot, but on the coast, you could see some freezing drizzle. And then tomorrow, it looks like we've got some flurries sweeping across much of the island. And then there could be some snow again in Labrador. And it's that low pressure system that was up here off Labrador, swirling around, bringing all that snow to Labrador and wind to the island. Well, that has moved away and it looks like there is some high pressure there left behind it. And here's our future tracker taking a look at our weather we can see some of those snow flurries over Labrador and by the early morning hours it looks like we'll have some flurries possibly here on the southwest coast that will sweep across much of the island and the south coast tomorrow. We'll break that down for you coming up a little later in the show. Thanks Heather. The Newfoundland and Labrador English School District says a student was sent to hospital as a precaution yesterday after a school bus malfunctioned. The bus experienced a mechanical failure shortly after leaving the parking lot of a junior high school in Mount Pearl. A spokesperson says there was a sudden jolt and one student complained of a sore back and was taken to hospital. The board says the bus is not part of the Gladney's fleet, whose contract was suspended last month after a pedestrian was killed. It also says the bus was in at its regularly scheduled time, the investigation into what's happening is ongoing. Well, that failure came up in the legislature today with the opposition claiming a rear axle on the bus collapsed, something it says could have been much more serious. In particular in question, I uh, was inspected uh, last summer and then they had uh, another inspection submitted to us as late as January of this year. Rear axle almost came fully off the bus for something that was inspected in January. That's very unusual. We're lucky this isn't much more serious incident. I asked the minister, when was the last time her department inspected this bus? That in particular school bus in question was inspected by an official inspection station in January of this year and that report was sent to us. And if it hasn't been already made its way to the website, it will be imminently speaker. Um, in terms of the bus, it is not in operation at the moment. Obviously, as there is an active investigation by the RNC uh, and our highway enforcement officers are assisting with that. Well, now to another school story in Nova Scotia, where Halifax Regional Police have laid charges in a stabbing yesterday. Three people were injured in an incident at a school in Bedford. A 15-year-old person is now facing charges that includes two counts, each of attempted murder and aggravated assault. Police responded to a weapons call at around 9.30 yesterday morning and found two school employees stabbed. They're in hospital in serious but stable condition. Police say the youth is getting treatment for non-life-threatening stab wounds. Every incident of violence within a school, um, you know, we take very, very seriously. Uh, we respond quickly. We keep the lines of communication open with the schools and uh, do that on a regular basis. This particular incident um, is uh, an incident that is very uncommon. Um, you know, the level and the impact and, uh, you know, the, the details that were involved and obviously can't share a lot of them with you today because the investigation is ongoing. Well, back in this province, the inquiry into Innu children in care resumes sitting tomorrow, but there won't be any scheduled witnesses. Instead, the doors are being opened to any person in the Innu communities who want to speak. The chairs at the Shehajit Youth Centre are being put out in a circle. The inquiry believes this is a way to welcome anyone in the community who wants to appear either Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. Mental health support workers will also be present and there is an opportunity for people to share their thoughts privately with the three commissioners who are overseeing the hearings. What we want to do is be sensitive to what makes people comfortable so that uh, we want to be respectful of uh, how people like to share stories. We want to make sure that uh, it's an intimate setting, even though it's a public setting, and uh, for the most part, allow people to uh, know that what they're saying is being respected by the, by the inquiry, and that it's important for the entire community to hear. Well, it's an issue that's top of mind for many parents in the province right now. 
childcare. Last week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Clarenville to talk about $10 a day childcare. Some families have been availing of it since the beginning of this year, but others say the Prime Minister's visit left them frustrated. Here now is Daryl Roberts reports. It's been almost a year since Krista Walsh had her son, Luca, after six years of trying and going through fertility treatment. The best and hardest job I've ever had. Walsh knew she was going to go back to work after having her son, but after experiencing multiple miscarriages, she didn't want to join a waitlist for a daycare while pregnant. I just wasn't comfortable personally doing that. Um, didn't want to jinx anything, you know. After Luca was born, Walsh began looking for daycares, but she was out of luck. It was a two and a half year wait list just for 18 months. Um, and a lot of them weren't even taking names at that point. Last week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in the province to talk about the federal government's $10 a day child care program. When parents can afford child care, they can build their careers and build the futures they want for themselves and for their families. This is good for families, especially for mothers. Walsh was due to go back to work this week, but she can't. We have no options at all. Um, it's super stressful. Um, before I was due to go back to work, I was kind of like, oh, I'll find something, we'll find something. I really, really thought we would, and we, we didn't. Premier Andrew Fury says he's aware of the problem, and the province is working to train more early childhood educators. Education Minister John Haggie says a new wage grid due April 1st should help with retention. One of the hopes is that with a competitive pay schedule, that there are between six and 800 potentially ECEs who were trained and qualified, who left the system because of um, uh, what they regarded as inadequate compensation. At least one of those former early childhood educators says she misses her job. If the wage had been higher, I would have never left. That's the truth. I would have stayed there forever, probably, if the wage if the wages had changed. Brittany Humphrey worked in a daycare for four years, but couldn't afford to live off what she was making. I would definitely consider going back if the wage was a livable wage. I mean, like I said, it's a lot of responsibility. Meanwhile, Walsh says she can't afford to stop searching. And in this economy, we can't survive on one income. So it's really scary because I don't know what's going to happen. If I can't go back to work and we're only living on one income, I don't know if we can live in our house. Walsh says she hasn't given up hope, but right now her chances of finding a spot feel bleak. Daryl Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. If we're able to find technologies that can bolster the ability of people to, to use the air to get emergency supplies to people, it uh, could be a real force multiplier for search and rescue. Transport Canada was in Western Labrador earlier this month testing out drones, dropping canisters with parachutes attached. We'll hear why right after Heather's Wet. And it was a windy, windy, windy night last night and we had lots of gusts even in today. We'll break down the top gusts a little later.
Police and computer security experts are warning people about a new take on an old scam, one that uses cheap and easy to use artificial intelligence platforms that can replicate anyone's voice. I think that what we have here is a sophisticated uh, operation, certainly a crime network. I'm Ryan Cook and we'll have that story tomorrow night on Here and Now. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Bonus prize deadline is midnight, Thursday, April 6th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. I think there were some pretty sleepless nights for a lot of people last night as they listened to the winds whispering through their eaves and wondering mm -hmm. whether or not they'd still have a roof in the morning. I know. My house <laughs> shook in the windows a couple of times last night waking me up. I know. You just kind of, it's like, okay, the house has been here for a hundred years. It's seen worse. <laughs> exactly. Come on. It's going to be here in the morning. <laughs> I took the dog for a walk after work last night as well. And his little ears were floating in the wind. And I thought the pair of us were going to blow away <laughs> during some gusts. And it was really, really windy. I've got some of the top gusts to show you. Uh, we can take a look here now. And uh, in Green Island, they clocked 130 kilometers an hour. And that's as, as of 8.30 this morning. And these numbers are courtesy of uh, Rodney Barney. Uh, he's with Environment Canada. Fogo Island, 121 kilometers per hour. Ramia, uh, 100 and 16 Bonavista, 114 into Greats Cove, about 110. And uh, when we get down to St. Anthony and to St. John's, 108 kilometers per hour. Now I know we've had worse, but it was definitely a windy night. And even into today, this morning, it was gusty coming into work, uh, 90 Four in St. John, 76 in St. Lawrence, 87 in Bonavista. But you can see uh, in Labrador and through some parts of the West Coast and the Northern Peninsula, the winds ramping down. And you can see the future gusts of the winds. They're going to continue to ramp down into the 40 to 60 kind of kilometer per hour uh, zone overnight before they uh, lighten up even more. So let's take a look now at our current temperatures across much of the province. Around one, zero uh, for the eastern half of the island, a little warmer down on the south coast, two degrees in St. Lawrence, and a little bit cooler as we uh, round the south coast and on up into the west coast, the northern peninsula and into Labrador, where it is about minus eight for Labrador City, Churchill Falls into Nain and to Hopedale as well. When we factor in the wind chill, uh, it's not going to be as chilly as it was last night, but again, it's colder than the posted temperature mark when you factor in the wind as cool as minus 18 in Makovic and minus 13 in Labrador City. Taking a look at our future tracker now, we see some of that snow flurry activity over Labrador West and that will be pushing across parts of Labrador. And as we get into tomorrow, this is going to be our weather maker for tomorrow. This could bring flurries across the south coast, much of the island, increasing cloud pushing east across much of the island as we go into tomorrow. Taking a look though at tonight, our forecast for tonight, we could have a chance of flurries for St. John's, Bonavista into central. Temperatures around minus five, minus four for much of the east coast of the island, a little chillier down on the south coast and in Marystown, minus six uh, cloud for you tonight and some increasing cloud in Port of Basque as those snow flurries do approach as we go into the west coast. We'll pick up a few more flurries and on the northern peninsula, Port of St. Anthony, two to four centimeters of snow for you folks tonight and that snow into the straits as well. Cartwright McCovic on the coast, you could see some freezing drizzle tonight, uh, two to four centimeters expected in Happy Valley Goose Bay and five in Labrador City Wabush tonight. Taking a look at tomorrow now, mainly sunny, looking like a pretty nice spring day for the Avalon Peninsula. Could get a few uh, flurries increasing cloud as the day goes on on the south coast down here in Buren Peninsula. As we head into central, some parts of central could see some increasing cloud picking up a few flurries, but it will be, you know, sun, mix of sun and cloud for central for the morning as we get that cloud and flurries sweeping across the island. Uh, similar for uh, the west coast, we'll have some cloud, few flurries possible, 
And as we head on up to the northern peninsula in St. Anthony, your snow will be ending in the morning, picking up about two centimeters in Cartwright tomorrow. And as we head on up into Labrador tomorrow, five more centimeters for Makovic. You guys got 50 over the last few days with those blizzard conditions. So that's quite a lot that you're digging out underneath and two to four centimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay expected into tomorrow. We will have your long range forecast coming up a little later on. A team from Transport Canada is using Labrador to test out innovative drone technology that could change the way search and rescue happens in the future. The drone carries a six kilogram canister with a precision parachute that can land within just five feet of a GPS coordinate. A member of the team spoke with Here Now's Jeremy Eaton in Labrador City during Kane's Quest. So we have a, an innovation that we're working with uh, from a company called AVSS based out of New Brunswick. They make smart parachutes. And so the parachutes are able to deploy from a fixed point in, in the air, whether it be from a plane or a drone or otherwise, and then land at a precise point on the ground with a useful payload. So that could be medical, that could be emergency response, could be uh, food, could be gasoline for a snowmobile that's, uh, that's run out, really whatever the situation needs. We thought this was a really great occasion to see if the technology is able to stand uh, a, uh, a challenging real world situation as well as a challenging environmental conditions like the cold and the wind. It looks like a quadcopter and then underneath it is a large canister which has a parachute attached to the top. So we will dispatch the drone to GPS coordinates, maybe associated with a lost snowmobiler. The drone flies out to that location and then the canister drops off, parachute deploys, and then the parachute takes consideration of other factors like wind and whatnot, adjusts itself on the way down, and I believe it's 95% of the time will land within five feet of where it's trying to go. The tests themselves are, are usually focused on some new prototype in the transportation space. Could well be something that we want to validate for ourselves as a department. Maybe it's a tool that we want to add to our kit. Uh, in other cases, it's something new and exciting that we'd like to get ahead of. So maybe it's uh, used in really particular circumstances now on a trial basis, but in the future it could become commonplace. We'd like to know as much as we can about it early on so that we're ready for it when it does become more commonplace. We think there's a lot of potential for it, so we, we want to be here to understand all the ins and outs of it. But uh, right now, it's extremely difficult to get to helicopters places. Sometimes they're grounded due to conditions. Sometimes you just don't have them available because they're missioned with other things. Uh, if we're able to find technologies that can bolster the ability of people to, to use the air to get emergency supplies to people, uh, it could be a real force multiplier for search and rescue. It was affecting me so negatively that I felt like I couldn't properly contribute to my school anymore. Newfoundland and Labrador isn't always a welcoming place. Tonight there's a documentary looking at the experience of racism felt by some students. I'll introduce you to two of the people in the documentary coming up.
Well, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we like to think that we're welcoming, but that isn't always the experience that people face when they come to the province. There's a documentary tonight that's looking at the experience of young people who have come from other places to Newfoundland and Labrador, and two of the people in the documentary are with me here. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. So, first of all, uh, I, I want to ask you about the experiences that you shared in this documentary. So what was your experience when you first came to Newfoundland and Labrador? What sort of reception did you get? When I first moved here, it was it seemed very welcoming and everyone seemed very lovely. But when you got to school and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're new, where are you from? And you say, oh, I'm from Ontario. That's when the hostility came in. The very, On the second day of school when I first came to Newfoundland, I was told that mainlanders should be stoned. And it only really progressed from there when I was during certain cultural holidays when I began to share my culture and my religion, it just got worse from there. Being like people threatened to rip off my sari and beat me up, or people were just making fun of the fact that I was from a different culture, like attacking my family personally or religiously because we were from a different culture. What was it like to go through that? It was disheartening and upsetting because when you hear all these nice things in Newfoundland and Labrador, everyone's like, Newfoundland and Labradorians are so accepting and they make you feel like you're a, a home away from home. But when you actually go there and you experience this racism, it's kind of like shattered reality to what actually is, to what it actually is, sorry. And um, it really made me question, because I was also growing up there. I came here when I was like 11, 12. It really made me have to um, think about things more deeply when I like, talk to people or sort of like how I framed things, kind of like how to protect myself from these attacks as well. Yes. So Miguel, you grew up playing hockey. Uh, what was that experience like? Um, I think from a very young age I knew I was different. I knew I was, I'm, I'm an Asian Canadian so I was different and I was reminded I was different in very different ways so things were good but things were bad. I think the bad was highlighted. It was, wasn't great. No. And, and tell me what, what was the bad side? What were some of those experiences that you went through? I think a lot of the ignorances, the stuff like people are surprised that I play hockey, people are, are questioning my ability just because of the way I look and different slurs and just being pointed out and yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't great. Yeah. And what did that do for your hockey experience? Because this is supposed to be team building, this is supposed to be the thing that you look forward to. It isolated me, for sure. I, I think. Looking back on it now at 27, I realized how it affected my mental health and how much it, it put me in a box away from everyone else. And no, it wasn't great. It wasn't great, no. This isn't easy to talk about, um, both to me now and in the documentary. I want to ask each of you, why did you decide to come forward and share your stories? Um, personally, I decided to come forward and share my stories because I wanted to make Newfoundland a better place for people who are also coming from, not from Newfoundland, even people who are here but who also still face racism and discrimination. I wanted it to become, this documentary, to become like an educational tool for these people, or people who treat these people with racism and discrimination and disrespect. I wanted it to be a resource for people to understand, like, similar to how you mentioned how it's like he felt isolated and alone, for people to understand like they are not alone, but they also shouldn't have to, all, everyone shouldn't have to face this in general. So this, I wanted this, I wanted to participate to share my story as a learning tool for people who are perpetrators of the racism and discrimination to help like learn how what they're doing is affecting people, but also for people who are facing it to understand that like it's not just them and to like definitely reach out and with people like sharing our cultures who can definitely help you with this these issues as well. Very similar answer, I guess. For I really wanted to share my experiences and one, hopefully help people learn from those experiences and like you said, just not feeling alone because during those situations you, you really do feel like alone and, and only compounds from there. So I think making sure people don't feel alone in those same situations. What about the decision makers, the people that are either running the schools, running hockey? What role do you think they have and what do you think they can learn from the experiences that are being shared here? I guess a big thing as well that also contributes to people who are experiencing these things that helps contribute to their isolation is that people often ignore the problem when you bring it up or they're very dismissive of it which makes you question if it was ever actually a problem so I guess one thing I can say for the decision makers is to not brush aside the issue and to actually address it 
when someone comes to you with these issues because if you don't address it when the first person comes there's obvious people who experienced it before that and there's going to be people who experience it after that so if we address it when you hear it there will be less chance for this problem to fester for others i think very similar answer but um comes down to like color blindness. I think it's important to not turn a blind eye and learn from all the situations because, you know, in my experience, it was always like, that's not that racist or is that really racist or should we actually do something? So that creates like an effect where you're only, you're building a tolerance racism where the small things aren't being addressed and the middle aren't being addressed, only the widely overt is being addressed. So I guess my answer would be not be colorblind and learn and listen to those situations. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for sharing your experiences, and good luck tonight uh, screening the documentary. Thank you. Thank you. A few weeks ago, we introduced you to Yao Antwia J. He's one of the co-owners of the 1949 Barber Shop in St. John's. His business has expanded to a second location, and there's a third in the works. His business also co-sponsors three soccer teams, and he's devoted to building community and helping newcomers integrate into the province. And it's why he's been named one of CBC's Black Changemakers for Newfoundland and Labrador. Take a look. It's known as the UN of barber shops with clients from all over the world, servicing St. John's, a city that's growing in diversity. Though he'd barbered before, back home in Ghana and in Toronto, 1949 shop co-owner Yao Antwia J was first reluctant to join the business after moving to St. John's in 2016 to do a Master of Philosophy at Memorial University. I was a little bit skeptical because I just arrived here. I haven't even found my footing. I didn't even know if I was going to stay or not. So it was kind of a difficult decision to make at that time. But stay he did, and the shop has flourished, with two locations now on Torbay Road and the Village Mall. And like the province's diversity, Yao Antwia J and his business partner Gustavo are hoping to grow, with a third spot in the works, likely in Conception Bay South. I knew if we do things right, we're going to expand. And you cannot even think of a business if you don't have the mindset of expansion. And it's not just about making people look and feel good. He's got another business in the works, cars. I buy cars, new, use, like, and ship them to Africa. He's planning on opening a mechanic shop too. But back in the barber shop, Antwia J gives clients more than a haircut. He gives them space and helps them connect with others. We've created that space where like, people feel comfortable to talk about anything. We, we don't put senses on anything. We just let people express what they feel. And it has been like the first point of call like, when people arrive in St. John's and we try to connect people no matter how. We, we try our best to connect people to get well, like, settle in the society. Victor Abudarin is one of those people. He met Antwia J at the barber shop when he came also to do a master's degree and now plays on one of the three soccer teams sponsored by 1949. It also goes outside of soccer if I need advice on anything. Even when I was about to get my first car, I consulted him to know what do you think about this, what do you think about that. So um, our relationship now is more than just um, a soccer club. The newest team, part of Mount Pearl Soccer Association, just like the barbershop, has a lot of diversity. And it's in a league that plays for the Challenge Cup. We actually love sports and we feel sports is one of the best ways that you can integrate people in a society. Sports has no barrier with language or anything, culture. We all speak the same language on the field of play. It's that community impact, along with Antwia J's entrepreneurship, that's led him to be named one of CBC's Black Changemakers, something his teammates, who met him through, you guessed it, the barbershop, say is well-deserved. He's always connecting everybody from, you know, our community as well, but throughout all the international communities. He's always bringing people together, whether it's, you know, just friendship and camaraderie or business opportunities. He's a wonderful person, very helpful with the community, and is just very giving, so I'm very happy that a good friend like that has gotten an award. 
And it's an accolade that Antwio J calls inspiring. It's a stepping stone to actually do more. And this Sunday, CBCNL and The Rooms are teaming up to celebrate black culture by hosting a free afternoon of activities for families with young kids. And it's happening from 2 to 4 p.m. And our own Aoife Alaba will be there. She'll be hosting. And there's going to be music, books, lots of fun. You can head to cbc.ca slash nl and click on the community page for more details. When I saw what I looked like after I finished the first edit, and I felt more at peace. And then I started thinking, I know so many people who could benefit from this. This photo editor is turning back time to help people reimagine and regender their childhood images. So that story is just ahead. Well, tonight we're shining our spotlight on a photo editor who offers a very specific service. Her business is called Gender Carpentry. It's all about reworking old childhood photos, adapting them to match who a person is now, post-gender transition. 
I'll let Andrea Carpenter explain. I remember the look on my mom's face the first time that she saw one. She was confused at first. She didn't know what to think, but then she finally said, Jerry, we gotta get a frame for this. My name is Andrea Carpenter. I am a photo editor from St. John's. The most basic way that I can describe an affirmation edit is a gender confirming change to a memory. I take what you would have looked like before you transitioned and I apply who you are now to it so that it's more comfortable for you and everyone else. When I transitioned about eight years ago, my family decided to put away all of the photos of me from around the house from before. And it was kind of painful and uncomfortable for everybody at the time, but I didn't like seeing them go into a little box in a closet and start to gather dust. So one day it clicked for me when I was doing an edit, I could do something about this. And so I started with myself. When I saw what I looked like after I finished the first edit and just seeing that kid the way that I wish I had looked at the time, I was kind of breathtaking a little bit and I felt more at peace. And then I started thinking, I know so many people who could benefit from this. The first thing that I did was I went around to some of my trans friends to get the word out and I asked a few of them if they wanted an edit and they all overwhelmingly said yes. The reaction that I've had when I've shown the finished product to my friends has been just kind of like a, a quiet wow. Like a, you see it wash over their face, like this is what I've wanted but couldn't articulate. These things are not just for trans people, they're for their families, their friends, anybody who wishes that they could put up the photo of their child or their brother or sister from before the transition, a memory of a vacation that they no longer get to revisit again. It's, it's for those people to be able to feel comfortable having that around. I feel like this is important because it's restoring a sense of peace to a memory that you once loved. It's bringing something back that you thought you could never have again. Heavy machinery is now being used to search for six people still missing after a fire in Old Montreal last week. The Heritage Building was being used as a short-term rental. As Melissa Francois explains, officials are warning of the instability of the building, meaning it's going to be a slow search. We know the count remains for now. Six people are still missing. One body was recovered. We know it's a, a woman, but we don't have her identity yet. Uh, this morning, the coroner was on site. She is now part of this investigation. And because the victims will have to be identified through a scientific method, family members might have to provide DNA samples. Here's Montreal Police. It will be a long process and uh, we will not be able to give names very fast, but we cannot make a mistake. We cannot, uh, we cannot give a name and then a, a few days later realize that we made a mistake. That is not an option. Identification of a victim uh, needs to be done by two factors. Now, those two factors, in those two factors, one needs to be scientific, okay? So, for example, using DNA would be one, uh, using uh, dental uh, x-rays. Now let's look at the plan of action for today. The investigators will go inside what is left of this historic building here in Old Montreal with a crane because the structure is still unstable. They will be deployed in targeted area where they were not able to explore before. So as you can see, this will be a very delicate task for them. Six people are still missing. They are from Quebec, Ontario, and the United States. Melissa Francois, CBC News, Montreal. 
Well, starting today, you can track your passport application online. Social Development Minister Karina Gould unveiled a new system that will free up more staff to process passports. Starting today, if you have applied for a passport and provided your email address, you'll be able to check the status of the application at canada.ca slash passport dash status. It's a self-serve tool, an online tracker, that will let applicants check their status of their application. Gould says processing delays have been virtually eliminated and that 99% now are completed on time. The pandemic had led to a lull in passport applications, but demand skyrocketed once restrictions began being lifted. Former U.S. President Donald Trump remains a free man, despite his own prediction that he'd be arrested today. A grand jury in New York continues to investigate accusations Trump made illegal payments to an adult film actress to remain quiet about an alleged affair. However, that grand jury is not sitting today. New York police have been putting up barricades around the courthouse in Manhattan. They're bracing for a potentially violent demonstration by Trump supporters if he is arrested. The former president, who is running for re-election in 2024, called for a protest over the weekend when he announced that he was expecting to be arrested today. In Florida, a group of supporters staged a rally near Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Well, spring has sprung in Mexico. This was the scene yesterday. Thousands of people from around the world came to welcome the spring equinox here at the Pyramid of the Sun, about 50 kilometers north of Mexico City. Experts still aren't sure why the pyramid was originally built, but it's believed to have been a gathering place for astrological events for nearly 2,000 years. Stay tuned. Heather's going to have a much shorter range forecast than that coming up next.
go now to Moncton, where the African community is giving back to a longtime volunteer. For 40 years, Mike Galland has been a familiar face for African newcomers. You'll spot the Dieppe senior at cultural events, dinners, and he often uses his truck to run errands for other people. When he ran into some car trouble, the community sprang into action. I've been involved with the uh, African and Caribbean, the black community here since the late 1970s, early 80s. Then I got to get to know some of the African students at the university and then some people from around here. I help them out with their, uh, when they have an event going on and uh, when they want to move and stuff like that. And uh, I go to their, their houses and go to their places uh, when there were things go on and they're going on and help them out with the move, moving and stuff like that, a lot of the students. I do things like that with the, with the truck, you know, and I help them work around their houses and stuff. When my truck broke down, I had a truck, same as the one out there, but what happened to it, uh, the inspection went expired on it and then I couldn't get it repaired. C'est quelqu'un de connu, et c'est quelqu'un qui, uh, qui a facilité aussi beaucoup l'intégration des de nouveaux arrivants euh, par euh, son assistance à les aider à trouver des meubles, à les aider à déménager et à faire des courses, et, etc. Donc euh, voilà, c'est quelqu'un qui a été toujours au service, qui a mis sa disponibilité au service des, de la communauté immigrante de Moncton. J'ai estimé euh, que c'était important pour nous de faire quelque chose pour lui. Et c'est comme ça que l'idée est venue de lancer la, la campagne levée de fonds. On a pu quand même mobiliser 4000 et quelques euh, dollars qui nous a permis d'acheter ce, ce camion-là. People help me out a lot, you know, and I help it to uh, keep on being a, a good guy for them, you know, help them out. Well, we're looking ahead at the forecast, mm -hmm. and we've had St. Patrick's Day, and there hasn't been <laughs> a snowstorm, so we're all on the lookout for Sheila's brush, at least yeah. in St. John's. Yeah. McCovic would have a very different point of view on They're this. They're still digging out from 50 centimeters, I'm sure, over the last couple of days, but it does look like we have some snow in the forecast for Friday. I don't know how much yet, but uh, we can talk about that as Friday yeah. comes a little closer. But let's take a look at Thursday. So Wednesday evening, you'll see a few scattered flurries across much of the province. We talked about the flurries that will be sweeping across. And then Thursday looks like a pretty decent day for much of the island. On the east coast, uh, for the Avalon, it looks like we could have some cloud and some flurries. And we will have a chance of flurries into central Bonavista, Clarenville area kind of there as well. Along the south coast, it looks like we will have a mix of sun and cloud on Thursday. But those clouds come back as soon as we get to the west coast and into St. Anthony where we could have some flurries there as well. Labrador Thursday looking finally like a really nice day mix of sun and cloud for you folks on Thursday. But this is what we're watching right here as we go on into Friday. So let's take a look at that graphic and the motion and what it could bring to the province. Here we go. Let's take a little closer of a look snow pretty well for uh, the Avalon Peninsula, Bonavista Peninsula, Buren, South Coast. It looks like we will have some snow temperatures around minus one, minus two degrees. Uh, it could be some flurries for the West Coast and into Central and into uh, the Northern Peninsula. For Labrador, for the coast, it looks like we'll have some flurries, but we will pick up a little bit more snow in Western Labrador here as well. Taking a look now though at our five day forecasts, what's ahead bringing us into the weekend. Tomorrow looks like it'll be a pretty decent day, mainly sunny. Uh, as we get into Thursday, a 40% chance of flurries, some snow possible on Friday and Saturday, and some cloud on Sunday. So Sunday looks like your day if you're planning ahead. Uh, into central Newfoundland now, it does look similar. 
few flurries for you folks though. Thursday is your nice day and you could have flurries Friday, Saturday and Sunday for Western Newfoundland. Wednesday looks like you'll have some flurries and overcast day on Thursday, Friday some snow, more flurries possible Saturday, Sunday again like the East Coast looking like your day if you've got to get out and do anything at this time. Wednesday for Eastern Labrador, you've got some snow that we talked about. Thursday looking decent, chance of flurries Friday, Saturday, nice day Sunday. And for Western Labrador, it looks like your uh, forecast is fairly similar with Thursday and Sunday being your nice days. And here is our weather photo. Really the weather story for the last little while has been the wind. Yesterday and this morning, it was the wind. And a couple of days before that, even into like last week, it was all of the ice. And this picture encapsulates them both. It was taken by Dave Graham. And he took that in Conception Bay South yesterday at around two o'clock and we've got Lots of sea spray coming over that little bergy bit there and a few white caps. So it doesn't look like it was a very nice day to be on the water as well. And if you've got a photo that you would like to share with us, you can do so at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah, this is the time of year. You want to put some of that ice away for when the weather warms up and you can put it in a drink. <laughs> right now, I'm not feeling like, you know, I, I need a nice little iceberg bit to cool down my drink. Yeah, exactly. It's cool enough. You need a warm drink this time of year. Exactly. <laughs> well, and that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back with you again tomorrow. Good night.